if you look at the picture you can able to easily judge the topic that we are going to discuss today in the first picture here is the hollow section and you can see the failure of it you may able to judge the direction of application of load and by knowing the direction of load you can able to judge the type of member and here in this picture you have a four slender member which has a different end connection and with that different end connection the member behavior are different and here also there is a one vertical member whose failure is clearly visible in this picture and this is one of the common structure you might have seen in industrial building warehouse goodons etc where we are going to discuss about this vertical member in this class yes it is a compression member a column introduction to steel compression member what is a compression member a structural member which is subjected to axial compressive load it is called as a compression member example column is a very common compression member every people might have seen the vertical member in any building that's a column column is one of the compression member and in this picture the vertical member is a column but the member which is below and the member which is above is different the cross section of both the members are different how it is different what are all the sections that we can use in a column as a compression member those things we'll discuss in this class maybe in the later slides but as of now this vertical member is a column statue a statue is a temporary very light load carrying a compression member strut is also a compression member but that's not always vertical see mostly if you talk about a column most of the columns are vertical member but these days even the column are little inclined because or to increase the aestheticness of the building now many airports railway structure that they are building these days has the inclined compression member in roof truss the member which is in the middle these are either a compression or a tension member if it is a compression member then we call that as a strut the compression member in the roof truss are called as strut next compression member is a boom in crane you have the long arm that is also a compression member if you look at the picture this is the rope where this rope lifts the load and this this rope is attached to the crane and because of the force in the rope if you look at the force direction it is like this and away from the pulley the force in the tension member is like this this force creates the compression in this boom so boom is also a compression member again we have a picture of a same roof truss and in roof truss this the member which is in the middle or of either tension or compression as we have discussed already if it is a compression member then it is called as a strut the member which is on the top this is called as upper cord or a rafter rafter is also a compression member bracings we have seen this picture even in unit number 2 under the design of tension member again this bracings are of either tension or a compression member if it is a compression member then the design procedure is as same as the other compression members these are the common examples of a compression member 
First is a column, statue, strut, boom, rafter, and bracings. The very important parameter in compression member is the slenderness ratio. We'll discuss about this slenderness ratio in detail in coming slides, but we need to know what is a slenderness ratio. Slenderness ratio is the ratio of the effective length of compression member to the respective radius of gyration. If the slenderness ratio lambda increases, then buckling of the column or a compression member is also increases. Here is the table which gives different materials. First is the structural steel or mild steel. For a mild steel, the slenderness ratio are of in different numbers. One is less than 40. Then here slenderness ratio is between 40 to 150. And in the last slenderness ratio exceeds 150. Now, as I said, the slenderness ratio plays a major role in the behavior of a compression member. We even classify the compression member based on the slenderness ratio, types of column. First is a short column. Short column fails in crushing under incremental load because it is very short. Next is intermediate column. Intermediate column fails in kneeling. It is between crushing and buckling. Long column. Long column fails in buckling. So, there are three types of column. One is short column. Second is intermediate column. Third is a long column. And we classify these three different types of column based on its slenderness ratio. Because all the three columns are not behaving in the same manner. As I said, short column fails in crushing and intermediate column fails in kneeling and long column fails in buckling. All the three behavior are different. That is why we have classified into three. And those behavior are predominantly based on its slenderness ratio. Here is the picture which gives a rough idea about where you can have a short and long column. If you look at this column, the length of the column is relatively higher than compared to this column. So these columns are called as a short column and these columns are called as a long column. Again, I want to stress here is the column classification is not only based on its length. It is based on the slenderness ratio. So with the length, you can't exactly say which is short or which is long. Here are the few examples of its failure. First picture is a short column because it fails in crushing. Now if you apply the compression load, this column won't buckle. The buckling won't happen. If the crushing happens, then this column is called as a short column. And in this picture, it is clear that we have both columns. One is a short and another one is a long column. And if you apply a load, compressive load in a vertical member, if it crushes, see like this, then it is a short column. If you apply the load, if it buckles, if it buckles without crushing, it will buckle. Best example in day-to-day -day life is a scale and we have a different buckling of the columns. Again, all the column won't buckle in the same way. See, if you look at this column, it buckles like this. If you look at this column, the buckling shape is different from this one. And if you look at this column, again, the buckling shape is different. If you look at the column, this one, the buckling is completely different from all the other three. All the long column won't buckle in the same manner. Again, the buckling also depends on the end connection, how it is connected here and also at the bottom. Based on this end connections, 
the buckling shape varies from a long column to another long column. Again, as I said, the slenderness ratio lambda is defined as the ratio of effective length of compression member to the respective radius of gyration. If lambda increases, buckling also increases. We have another term which is called as non-dimensional slenderness ratio that is defined as the square root of ratio of yield stress to the Euler's buckling stress or critical stress. Again, if non-dimensional slenderness ratio increases, buckling also increases. So, buckling is directly proportional to the slenderness ratio. Whether it is a dimensional or non-dimensional, it is directly proportional to it. We have a three columns based on the value of non-dimensional slenderness ratio. If the non-dimensional slenderness ratio is less than or equal to 0.4, then it is called as a short column. Why? Because the member of this kind will fail in crushing. If the member has slenderness ratio between 0.4 to 1.2, then it is called as intermediate column. Again, why? Because this fails in kneeling. Third type of column is slender column or long column. Its slenderness ratio is greater than 1.2. This column is called as a slender column because it fails in buckling. Columns are usually a straight compression member whose length are greater than its cross section dimension. Buckling behavior is characterized by large deformation normal to loading. If you take this column, it has already buckled a little, but this is a compression member and the load from this beam is transferred to this column like this axially. So, this member is subjected to axial compression. So, this column is called as, so this member is called as a column. And if you look at the buckling, which is normal to the loading direction or which is transverse to the loading direction, the buckle happens in this direction, which is normal to the loading direction or transverse to the loading direction. When applied load increases, the buckling deformation also increases. As it is clear in this picture, if you increase the load, then the buckling also increases. Buckling resistance is high if the member or the column has high bending stiffness. E into I is called as a bending stiffness. You may have studied that in strength of materials or mechanics of deformable bodies. That E multiplied with the moment of inertia I is called as the bending stiffness. If the column has high bending stiffness, then the buckling resistance is high. That is, the resistance towards buckling is high. There are different cross section here. One is a large I section, and the one is a short I section, then channel section then two angle section, equal and unequal. Let's take first two I sections. If you take this I section, the axis lies here, I XX and YY axis lies here. If you calculate the moment of inertia, I XX, that is for sure, less than or equal to the moment of inertia about the same axis of the member 1. Let's name this as member 2 and this as member 1. The moment of inertia of member 2 is for sure less than the moment of inertia of the member 1 because the moment of inertia is calculated like this. Moment of inertia of any axis is equal to Ig plus A H square. 
where h is this value depth of the section if h increases then the moment of inertia of that member increases if moment of inertia increases obviously the bending stiffness also increases if the bending stiffness increases then its resistance towards buckling is also increases then the buckling resistance is i if the member length is small see here is a picture of a, a column whose length is this much let's say this length as a 2 meter height of column if you apply the load then it buckles like this if you decrease the load from 2 to 1 if this is the length of column then if you apply the load then it takes more load than the long member so even if you decrease the load length further then it takes little more load than the previous member because its length is little small see all those things will relate the concept with the equation in the later slides but as of now please understand the length is also proportional to its buckling resistance if the length decreases then buckling resistance increases in other words if you increase the length of the compression member then buckling resistance decreases structural steel has high yield strength and ultimate strength compared to rcc or pre stressed concrete slender member also experience local buckling both local buckling and global buckling is instability phenomena and should be avoided in any member especially in column now what is local and the global buckling if you look at this picture now even if it is horizontal member but applied load is along its axis okay so if you look at this direction applied load is along the axis even if it is horizontal because of this load pattern this is called as a column if you apply the load like this what happens here the member has not buckled the member remains straight but the a part of a member in a particular cross section buckles so this is called as a local buckling and in other hand if you take this column it is a vertical member and applied load is along the axis of the member so this is compression load and this column is a compression member here the whole member got buckled so this buckling is called as a global buckling you have to make sure that under working load both lo local and global buckling should not happen so local buckling happens only in a portion of cross section of a column example web buckling alone flange buckling alone as i said here the flange got buckled and here the web got buckled but the overall column remains straight global buckling is the buckling of the entire cross section every compression member has two principal axes one is major and minor if you look at the cross section you have two axes one is z z axis and the second is y y axis two different axes every section has two different axes mostly if you take this channel section again you have two axes one is z z let's say this z z and another one is x x this is where the cg of member lies again here also this is where the cg of member lies now what is major and what is minor axis it is very simple it is based on its value 
if the moment of resistance in Z is at axis, moment of resistance, if the moment of inertia about any axis is higher than the other axis, then that axis is called as a major axis. If you take Z, Z, its moment of inertia is denoted as I, Z, Z. If you take Y, Y, the moment of inertia is denoted as I, Y, Y. Can you guess roughly which moment of inertia is more and which moment of inertia is less? Whether I, Y, Y is more or less or I, Z, Z is more or less. Can you guess? Yes, I, Y, Y is more than I, Z, Z. Even if you can derive, you could able to judge the major and minor moment of inertia. If the moment of inertia value is more, then that axis is called as a major axis. So here, Y, Y is termed as the major axis because its moment of inertia is more than the moment of inertia in other axis and i z z axis is termed as the minor axis now why it is so important in compression member because if you take the cross section and imagine this is the length and its cross section is i okay so if you apply the load in which axis it is gonna buckle can you judge there is a direct relation between major axis minor axis to its buckling direction obviously whichever axis has less moment of inertia in that axis only the buckling is gonna happen because other axis moment of inertia is small if I draw the axis, this is the major axis and this is the minor axis. So let me give a different color to the minor axis. Yeah, this is the minor axis. Blue is the minor axis and green is the major axis. If you apply the load, I am sure the column is going to buckle in this direction. Now like if I draw the plan, it looks like this. If this is the I section and if you apply the load on its CG, if this is the major moment of inertia XX and the minor moment of inertia YY, then this column, if you apply more load, then this column will buckle along yy axis now it may shift to this direction or this, this direction because the moment of inertia along yy is the least compared to the xx again you take the same example of scale the scale cross section looks like this the width is much larger than its thickness Okay, this is thickness and this is the width. This is the cross section of normal scale what you have in hand. And this is its length. Now, if you apply the load like this, now in which axis it bends? Let me draw the both the axis. Again, this is in the middle. This is the axis y y minor axis, and this is the axis x x major axis. Now, whether it bends along the x x axis in this direction or whether it will bend along y y axis, along y y axis in this direction. In which axis it bends? Yes, it is along yy. If you apply, then it bends like this. 
the buckling will happen only about the minor axis not about the major axis so the minor and major axis is directly proportional to the buckling axis of the column the buckling of compression member takes place about minor axis traditionally the design of compression member was based on Euler's analysis of ideal column which gives upper band to the buckling load. However, practical columns are far from ideal and buckle at much lower loads. The significant step in the design procedure for columns was developed. Although these design procedures are more accurate in predicting the buckling load, Euler's theory helps in understanding the behavior of slender column. Euler's theory is only for the standard column and by knowing the Euler theory and its concept you can able to judge the buckling behavior of slender column or the critical load of a slender column and with that knowledge because Euler theory gives the upper bound value of the buckling load with that knowledge if you can able to design by Following the procedure which is given IS 800 2007, then the design can be done accurately. The maximum slenderness ratio depends on load combination. A member carrying a compressive load resulting from dead load and live load, the maximum slenderness ratio allowed is 180. So always you should check the limit of slenderness ratio. Now as we discussed if you look at the slenderness ratio, slenderness ratio is the ratio of effective length of column to the corresponding radius of gyration. Now what is radius of gyration? It is square root of moment of inertia upon its cross sectional area. So if you write the slenderness ratio in general, slenderness ratio lambda is equal to L effective upon square root of I by A. So this slenderness ratio is very important to judge the type of column and you can, you can relate clearly if the length is small then slenderness ratio is small then buckling will happen very quickly or in other hand buckling resistance is less. If the moment of inertia is more then slenderness ratio is less and also the buckling resistance is high. If the column is more slender then it buckles at a very less load as we discussed when we discussed about the length of the column. So you need to make sure every column should not be allowed its slenderness ratio more than the value prescribed here which is taken from IS 800 2007. If the member carrying a compressive load resulting from wind or earthquake then its slenderness ratio should not be greater than 250. A member normally acting as a type type is a tension member in a roof truss or a bracing, tension bracing but subjected to possible reversal of stress resulting from action of wind or seismic then its slenderness ratio should not exceed 350. Compression flange of a beam the slenderness ratio should not exceed 300. Next we have the effective length of column. As I said, the effective length depends on the end condition of column. If one end condition is fixed and the other end condition is a roller, it is allowed to move and also it is allowed to rotate at one end. Then the effective length, if this is the total length, then the effective length is 2L. Similarly, if both the ends are pinned pinned, then its effective length is 1L. If one end is fixed 
at the end is roller then effective length is 1.2 l one end is fixed at the end is pinned then its effective length is 0.8 both the ends are fixed then its effective length is 0.65 l this value of effective length is taken from is 800 2007 if you look at the table they have even given with the clear picture so here is the column one end is fixed other end is free there is nothing there is no restraint on the top of the column so if you look at in the table at other end both translation and rotation otherwise both movement and rotation at that end if you take this end the translation is the movement in either direction or rotation is this point rotates either like this uh, clockwise or anti-clockwise that is the rotation and the translation if both are free okay if both are free then it's called as a free end if both are restrained so it is not allowed to even move and rotate so that is fixed end so if both are restrained it is called as fixed end if both are free it is free end if one end is fixed and the other end is free then it is its effective length is two times the total length total length of column is this top to bottom is the total length of column similarly another common example is pinned pin so in both the end translation is restrained if you look at the translation at both the end it is restrained that means both the end is not allowed to move in either direction so it is not allowed to move this way but it is allowed to rotate in both the ends so this member if you apply the load then this point will rotate okay either this way or this way so that is the rotation so if translation is restrained and rotation is allowed then it is called as pinned end if both the ends are pinned then effective length is equal to total length or one times the total length then another very common example is one end is fixed both are restrained and other end is pinned because only rotation is allowed translation is restrained then it is pinned end so one end is fixed other end is pinned then its effective length is 0.8 times the total length another very common example is both are fixed in both the ends both translation and rotation are restrained in that case effective length is 0.65 times the total length now we'll see a effective length of a strut a strut is also a compression member which is in the roof press for a single angle strut the effective length is taken as the total length center to center of supporting member if you have a double angle discontinuous strut connected back to back on either side of the gusset plate but not less than two bolts at the end then its effective length is 0 0.7 to 85 times total length again double angle discontinuous strut connected back to back on one side of the gusset plate but not less than two bolts in the connection then the effective length is equal to total length then continuous member whether it is a cord or a rafter any continuous member whose effective length is 0.7 to 1 times the total length total length is from center to center of supports here are the few common example of a strut again if you look at this roof truss you have a four members which is in the middle all these four are of either compression or a tension member if it is a compression member then its effective length is calculated as prescribed in like here if single angle strut then effective length is total length if double angle discontinuous stress strut connected back to back or it is connected on either side of the gusset plate so the effective length depends so here are the picture which clearly shows there are more than two bolts 
and again a roof truss with the four member in the middle which is either a tension or a compression member whose effective length is calculated as prescribed in the previous slide. Now let's calculate the strength of compression member. Okay, as of now, we know the effective length of compression member column and its strut and we know the type of column, whether it is a long, short or an intermediate column, how it behaves, how it is directly proportional to its slenderness ratio, how slenderness ratio is linked to effective length and the moment of inertia. But now, how to calculate the strength of a member? We know its behavior, but we need to know how to calculate its strength. Now, in IS 800 2007, in class 7.1.2, it is stated that the design compressive strength of a compression member is equal to area into stress. Obviously, load is equal to area into stress. Simple. So, AE is the effective cross-sectional area. Whatever the cross-sectional area of the member, that is the AE. FCD. FCT, FCD is the design compressive stress, which is FCD and it is given in the class 7.1.2.1. So, design compressive stress FCD is equal to Fy upon gamma m0 upon eta plus eta square minus lambda square all to the power 0.5 that is square root of eta square minus lambda square. 1 by this denominator, what of the denominator, okay. So, this can be written as stress reduction factor. So, FCD design compressive strength design compressive strength is also written as stress reduction factor multiplied with yield stress upon gamma m0 which should be always less than or equal to yield stress upon gamma m0 or this stress reduction factor can be calculated if you know what is the eta and lambda. So, eta is given here 0.5 times 1 plus alpha multiplied with lambda minus 0.2 plus lambda square. Now, what is lambda? So, here the lambda is a non dimensional effective slenderness ratio. As we discussed early, non dimensional effective slenderness ratio is the square root of yield stress upon critical stress or Euler buckling stress. If you, if you see the Euler buckling stress FCC equal to pi square E by lambda square. So, here this is the slenderness ratio. So, this KL by R is a slenderness ratio. So, slenderness ratio as we discussed early, effective length upon its radius of gyration R. So, effective length we have seen that effective length may be 1 times L or 2 times L or 0.8 times L for pinned pinned for fixed fixed it is 0.65 times L. So this value which is here is in general can be termed as K. So KL is the effective length. So effective length upon its radius of gyration is the slenderness ratio lambda. Okay, now if you know what is Euler buckling stress by knowing the Young's modulus of steel, by knowing the slenderness ratio in a sense effective length, its radius of gyration, then we can calculate Euler's buckling stress. Now what is alpha? The alpha is the imperfection factor which is given in table number 7. The imperfection factor alpha depends on the buckling class. If the column's buckling class is A, then imperfection factor is called is 0.1. If the column's buckling class is B, 
then imperfection factor is 0.34. If the buckling class goes to D, then imperfection factor increases to 0.76. Now, how to calculate the column's buckling class? We know it's major axis, minor axis, but as of now, we have not discussed about its buckling class. So, the buckling class for any cross section is given in table number 10 of IS 800 2007. If you take the table number 10 for rolled I section, you have two axes one is EZZ and another one is YY. We know that EZZ is the major axis and YY is the minor axis. So, if you have this criteria H upon uh, the thickness of flange is greater than 0.2, then thickness of flange is less than or equal to 40 mm, then the buckling will happen along EZZ or YY. So, whichever is least, whichever moment of inertia is least among EZZ and YY, the buckling will happen in that axis. So, here it is clear that EZZ is the major axis and YY is the minor axis and if the cross section follows this criteria, I am sure that it is going to buckle in YY axis of this cross section, okay, of this shape. So, if the buckling happens in YY, then the column's buckling class is P. Now, if you take the other sections, see now let's take this section, okay, hollow sections. Nowadays, we are using more hollow sections than the other sections. If you go to a railway station, if you go to any new structure that we build, the best example is even in our institution, we have a parking. So, in all the parking, the new parking which we have built is made of a circular that do not vertical column, inclined column, because that increases the aesthetic appearance. So, and the hollow section has more advantage than the I section or any other section because its moment of resistance is equal in any axis you take. If you take axis this way, 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 in all the axis the moment of inertia is same. So, it means that it is the effective cross section for the column. Now, if you apply the compression load, you don't know in which axis it is going to buckle. So, whichever axis is least or in whichever axis the moment of inertia is least, that is where the column is going to buckle. So, no matter how high you have the moment of inertia of other axis. So, for example, you take this I section, a huge depth I section. The moment of inertia about X axis is maybe tenfold of moment of inertia about minor axis yy. This is the minor axis yy. Okay. So, moment of inertia ixx is 10 times greater than the moment of inertia about axis yy. Even if you have like this, if you apply the load, column is going to buckle in axis yy because it is moment of inertia is least. So, even if you have more moment of inertia in other axis, it does not matter as far as its strength is concerned. It is waste. So, that is the uneconomical cross section. So, the best economical cross section in a column is equal moment of inertia, almost equal moment of inertia in any axis you take in the cross section. So, this circular column satisfies that. So, it is a economical column if you can compare with any other cross section. That is why, that is also one of the reasons we use more circular columns in the steel structure these days. So, for uh, hollow sections, if it is a hot roll, the moment of inertia can be any axis. Its buckling class is A. If it is cold formed, even any axis moment of inertia, the buckling class is B. And if you have a solid channel section, angle section, T section or a solid circular, solid circular, not hollow, solid circular or solid rectangular, 
the buckling axis even whatever the buckling axis the buckling class is c so this is how we will find the buckling axis of a different cross section based on its buckling axis the imperfection factor alpha alpha can be found out so if you know the imperfection factor then you know the lambda you know this equation you know fcc and if you know imperfection factor then the stress reduction factor can be calculated or this value one by this value can be calculated or in other hand the stress reduction factor can be calculated and if you know the stress reduction factor then you can calculate what is its design compressive stress of a given cross section and if you know the design compressive stress of a design given cross section then if you multiply with its cross section area then you can able to calculate what is its design compressive strength of a given column okay see is it like you need to use uh, the equation all the time it is not is 800 has given you the simple way to find out the stress reduction factor or even directly you can even calculate or know the value of design compressive stress so in is 800 you have a four tables table 8a and table 8b 8c 8d there are four tables in 8 table 8 8a 8b 8c 8d all the four table is for the four buckling classes 8a is for buckling class a 8b is for buckling class b and so on so if you know for your cross section if the buckling class is a then you need to refer 8a so in 8a if you know its slenderness ratio and if you know the yield stress of the column then you can compute the value suppose if yield stress is imagine 250 and the effective slenderness ratio is 70 then your stress reduction factor is this value now no need to calculate anything using the equation you can make use of this table so you can find stress reduction factor then multiply with the yield stress and upon partial safety factor gives the design compressive stress you can calculate stress reduction factor and you can use again this equation to calculate the design compressive stress or the design compressive stress also can be taken from the table so that is given in table 9 and again you have a four tables in the table 9 series 9a this is 9a 9b 9c and 9d all the four are for four buckling class table a is for buckling class a table 9b is for buckling class b and table 9c is for buckling class c table 9d is for buckling class d so for the given cross section if you could able to find its the buckling class then for the given cross section the buckling class is say b then you need to refer table b 9b so in table 9b again you have slenderness ratio and the yield stress so for example if you take the yield stress of the member is 250 and its slenderness ratio is 70 then the design compressive stress FCD is 182. That's it. Directly you will get the value. Once you get uh, what is the design compressive stress, then you multiply with its cross section. Then you can able to calculate what is the design compressive strength of the given cross section. The using table is much easier for me to calculate the design compressive strength. So it is my perception so you use both the method so use formula to calculate the effective uh, compressive design compressive strength and also use table to calculate its design compressive strength whichever method you feel easy you can follow that so either you can use table or you can use the equations so here are the few codal provisions of compression member first is buckling class of cross section that is must to calculate the strength of a compression member. 
which is given in table number 10. So we have already discussed about the working class. Second is effective length. Effective length is given in table number 11 for column and in paragraph for strut in IS 800. Third is stress reduction factor which is given in table 8 or you can even use the equation. There are four tables in 8 A, B, C, D and if you want to use the equation then stress reduction factor is equal to this. You can even using the equation you can calculate what is the stress reduction factor. The next is design compressive stress FCD that is also given in table 9. Again you have four different tables for four working classes. If you don't want to use table, you can use this equation. You can substitute all the value, then you can calculate what is the design compressive stress. Now, if you know design compressive stress, then you multiply with area, then you can calculate what is the design compressive strength PD. So that is how you can calculate the design strength of a given compression number.